the white owl story. Now, I have to explain some things before I tell the story. Um, and then you uh, can, maybe you'll understand it a little bit better, okay? Or should I say the story first? <laughs> I think I'll say the story first, okay? This is, a, you again, just like the deer woman stories, there's usually every family usually has a white owl story, something that happened to their relative. Some of them are recent stories. Some of them are, are very ancient stories. Yeah, but uh, they are um, they are stories that um, are scary. Yeah, here we go. I wrote this one out for another uh, platform. So I'm just going to read it. Um, okay. This story involves a woman who lived alone in a house that was on a hill just outside of town where I grew up. Yeah, It wasn't too far away from the town, you know, because you, cause you could see the town. It was just right there. It was just like, I don't know, maybe a quarter of a mile outside of town half a kilometer. It really wasn't that far. So you could see. It was on the hill so she could see in town. Yeah. And in those days, this 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 happened in the nineteen sixties. And in those days there were not that many street lights. The only street lights that there really were were on the main street. This was a town of about five hundred people. And uh the only paved road was the main street where all the stores were. And the other streets were gravel roads. But they they didn't all have street lights. So you know, the only lights you could see were the lights of the house. If the house had an outside light, then that's what you used, yeah? So, um, but on her house, she had a utility pole. So there was a light outside her house because it was out, out of town basically yeah. and so she could see ha, ha, at least ha, half of the way you know walking into town and um, and she lived alone in this house um, and she's kind of a kind of a wild woman yeah? she likes to get drunk and be with different men and so forth and um, so this one night um it was autumn, by the way, and no snow, you know, a little bit cold, a little bit chilly. But she wanted to go into town and get drunk at the local bar and, um, you know, hook up with a man and, you know, do that kind of thing. So um, she got a, a flashlight um, so she she could use it part of the way because there, there was no moonlight on this evening, so it was wherever it's going to be dark, it's going to be really dark, and she didn't want to step on any 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 snakes or anything like that, so she took a flashlight. So she was starting to walk into town, and um, when she got into the dark area, um, she heard something behind her, like wings flapping, and then it went over her head, yeah, and then suddenly it landed in front of her. So it was standing on the ground. So she shined a flashlight on it, and here it was a white owl. And it started to scream at her. And uh, it scared the hell out of her. But at the same time, you know, when you're from the country, or you come from a small town like this, um, white owls, when they scream, it sounds like a baby screaming. So it's, if you don't know that, that's going to really freak you out. Yeah, It's going to really scare you. So um, she knew it, she she heard it scream. It it that surprised her because it happened really quick, and uh, she tried to um, shoo it away, but it just stood there. Then she picked up some rocks and she started to throw it at the this bird, but it wouldn't do anything. And um, and then she was gonna you know just walk walk over it and here as she got closer it started to grow 
Yeah, it started to go, and pretty soon it was taller than her. So she turned around and ran back to her house, and she could hear it flapping. Yeah, it was chasing her. Um, oh, I left the part out. Every time it said something, it mimicked her. Yeah, it mimicked her. It's, it would you, it would imitate her voice, and it would say the same thing back to her, and that's when she got scared. Yeah. And as it grew, um, it, it scared her, and she became a believer. Yeah, so she turned around and ran back to her house, and locked up her doors, and turned on all the lamps, and um, started to, you know, burn sage. And she was praying, and the owl was sitting on top of that utility pole. Yeah, it was just sitting up there, and she stayed up the whole night because she was scared. And it sat up there until the sun came up. Then it it went, yeah, it flew away. And then uh, the next that morning she went walked into town uh, when it was daylight, and she went to her sisters and told her everything that happened. The sister told her, "I ah, see, you, you you have this. You better stop, you know, stop your whoring and drinking ways, or you know." And um, so um, this lady just. She laid down and went to sleep in her sister's house, and her sister went to work. Yeah. So um, the lady woke up in the e- early evening, and she decided to go to the bar. Her sister wasn't home, but she went to go to the bar anyway, and she started to get drunk. And then she ended up with a man that night, and the, and um, They got in his car and they drove south of town and the car, uh, he lost control of the car and the car spun and flipped several times. None of, nobody was wearing seat belts. So they got thrown from the car and were smashed. Yeah. The car landed on top of the lady. that was it she was dead yeah so this is this is why lots of people think that when you see a white owl that you're going to die <laughs> yikes <laughs> no i'm going to explain this so you can have a little bit more insight yeah like i said a lot of people who who don't know cultural information uh even Lakota people, yeah, the Lakota people when they hear these kind of stories today they think that that this is uh that when you see a white owl that it's a harbinger of doom. Yeah. That it means your life is over. No it doesn't. It doesn't mean that. First of all, owls represent wisdom, yeah. Owls in general represent wisdom and there's a lot of stories where they because of the owl um, would say something wise it would change the whole outcome of a story you know in a really good way yeah so um, I was just thinking of this one called the race around the black kilt I told that story several times and I will again later I mean in the future and it's an owl makes all the difference in the world in this story. Yeah, it makes the whole difference. So it's he's really uh, the owl is known for wisdom. And the white owl is known for warning. So it's trying when, when the sto- the our original tradition is that if you see if one f- flies in front of you. I mean not way out there, two miles away. No, I don't mean that. I mean right in front of you. It's it's this is the signal for you to stop where whatever you're doing, you stop. Turn around and go back to where you came from, wherever it is. Keep going until it's a safe place. So if you just came from the store, go back further. Where were you before the store? You see what I mean? 
you keep going back until you you um, arrive at a safe place. So you backtrack, even if it's leading you back to home. Yeah, you you backtrack, and then you you're supposed to burn some sage and smudge yourself, and then with the smoke, and then you uh, think, what's going on in your life right now? What is going on? You think of everything that's happening. Whoever is in your life, you think about your connection to them. You think about, you know, what is the current standing between you and them. You really take the time to think about this and you pray. And then you, you, you'll soon find out what's wrong. There is something wrong. And you have to fix it. Now, think about that. Was that a bad thing? No, it wasn't. This white owl was warning you because it cares for you. It doesn't want you to... It knows that if you continue living the way you are living, it knows that disaster is coming because like this, the white owls can see into the, your future. So they know when something disastrous is coming to you. So they want you to change your thought patterns and fix whatever is broken or nurture it anyway. Yeah, Pray about it. And this changes your thought patterns. And then that thing that was going to kill you or lead to your death, it's gone now. So the the white owl is actually protecting you. It's warning you because it cares for you. And this it, this is so catastrophic that it has to get your attention in such a way as to to make you think hence in the story this one it grew bigger yeah it imitated her voice it was trying to get her to go back and rethink something otherwise it would lead to if something really bad is hap- going to happen if she doesn't do that and in this story, she didn't follow it. The owl was trying to protect her. The owl was trying to get her to change her life. But she didn't listen. And sure enough, she ended up dead. So no, the owl, the owl did not bring death. She brought her own death. So she didn't follow the instruction. Her, even her sister tried to warn her. This is a true story, by the way. Yeah, the sister married my mother's brother. And she's my auntie. Yeah, This woman. Not the woman who died, but the woman who was trying to save uh, her sister. That I'm related to her. This is how I know the story. So, these are, you know, really serious, serious things. So when you think about it, it's, yeah, it was scarier than hell, but when you really think about it, when you know this information, you see that it's a compassionate story. The owl is trying to save her life. The owl is trying to get the woman to save her own life. And she didn't go through. She didn't follow through. So she ended up dying. She brought it herself. Yeah, the owl did not bring it. She brought it herself. That's the original understanding. But today, Indians, they they look at it as, they they see the white owl as a bad thing. Yeah? <laughs> and, and, and it's sad that it's, you know that that that's the way Indians are today. 
So how did we lose that? How did we lose our our way of thinking? Yeah. How how did we go from regarding the white owl as something that's you know warning you, that's trying to help you to save yourself? How did we go from that perspective to the one of see of say of of perceiving the owl as bringing death. See, we changed. Anciently, we saw the owl as a good sign that it's warning you. It's 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 wants to it wants you to live. But now, when Indians look at these things, they they interpret the white owl as a symbol of death. How did we change from that? From a healthy view to a one of doom and gloom. This is what happened back in the late 1800s when we were placed on reservations. There were prison camps in the beginning. And uh, this is um, a situation where we couldn't leave. We couldn't, uh, we were not allowed to hunt. Our knives and guns were taken from us. And um, we were only allowed to eat whatever the American government gave to us which was really no good food. The quality of the food was okay when it left places like Chicago and stuff like that. But once it got to, you know, some of these train stations uh, between there and the reservation, uh, a lot of these um, uh, handlers would sell it. And then um, they would buy old food and put that in there instead, and these uh, middlemen would make a lot of money. Yeah. So by the, what we got on a reservation was bullshit food. Yeah, it was really no good. And we ended up getting all kinds of diseases like uh, heart diseases, uh, hypertension, diabetes, you know, things like that. And then at the same time, our language and ceremonies were declared illegal by the United States. So we were hit physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Soon after that, our minds became weak. And these, as I said earlier, these are the four parts of the self. So with the four parts of the self being sick, we lost our connection to our sacred center. So we started to focus on communicating away from that. And then the priests came from the various churches, and they learned our ways and said that since our ways conflict with the Bible that our ways are evil, that they come from Satan. They come from the devil. So in our weakened state, we slowly began to accept that. Now, another thing is that there were some Lakota people that didn't want to accept that. They wanted to hang on to the traditional Lakota star knowledge ways. And if they revolted, they were sent to a mental hospital in Canton, South Dakota, which was set up for all reluctant Indians in America that did not want to become Christianized. They were sent there. And they, uh, the, these church priests also committed the medicine men, medicine women, holy men, holy women. They committed all of them to these mental asylums too. This way, the people would not go to them for help that they would come to the churches. They wanted the Indian people to only go to the priests and not their uh, traditional healers. So they sent the healers to med, uh they sent them excuse me, so they sent the healers to this uh, mental asylum to die. And if you are radical, you were sent there to die too. Yeah. So um while this is happening, the priests are saying to the uh, Indian people, if you uh, believe our way, we will help your children. And so, you know, th it was a very, very dire straits time. And so a lot of Indians became Christians because of that. Like I said, it, 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 we were weak-minded too at that point. And those who stuck it out, there were people who refused to accept Christianity, but they went to church anyway. What they were doing 
was they were putting up a candy store front. On the outside, they were acting like good little Christian Indians, but on the inside, they weren't. They were star knowledge people. Yeah? They did this because they didn't want to get sent to that mental asylum to die. That's sad, isn't it? But that's part of what happened back then. And it's because of these people who maintained this knowledge in secret. Thanks to them, you know, they passed it down, you know, to certain people like me. And we still have this knowledge. And I have this show and I'm sharing it with you. Because this regards the sacred center. And we all have that. Yeah, This is not a Lakota thing. This is a Ikche Oyate thing. Ikche Oyate means human being. When you live this way, as I said in the beginning, you communicate as a human, not as a Lakota, not as a German or a Japanese or an African. You communicate as a human. Yeah? That's really important to, to, to know. So, that's how it was back then. Yeah? Now, remember I said that the, the priest said to the Indians, we will help your children. So, they took the children away from the parents, sent them to boarding school hundreds of miles away, where these children were tortured to speak only English and learn a civilized Christian way. If they spoke about home, they were tortured. These schools didn't do background checks in those days. Yeah, uh, The pay was really low. So they got really no good teachers in these schools. A lot of these teachers were sadistic. They got sexual pleasure from torturing people. And here, this is like summer holiday camp for them. And the same thing for perverts. A lot of perverts now had their pick of the litter. And they could get away with it. That's what happened. A lot of these children were murdered. They were killed. They were raped. They were molested. And there's a lot of unmarked graves near these schools. Not all these children are accounted for. So, those who made it through, what they learned was whatever they saw. Because a lot of these children never went back home. They were told by the priests that their families had died. And that there was nobody there. And that broke their hearts. This is why some of these children, they were so sad, they couldn't eat. And they ended up starving themselves to death. And those who made it through, like I said, they didn't really survive because they were not able to process all these emotional traumas that they experienced. They didn't know how. Because the only adults that were around them were these unhealthy, abusive people, teachers, dorm matrons, cooks, janitors, priests. They were all unhealthy to them. That's all they knew. They learned how to become victims, and they learned how to become abusers to those who they considered weaker than themselves. So they didn't really survive. A lot of these children that made it through these schools, they had a lot of traumas that they didn't know how to deal with because all they saw was abuse. That's what they learned. They had, there was no adult healthy role models to emulate. I remember I said these children were told that their families were all dead, so they didn't go back during summer holiday. They just stayed at these schools and worked. 
So when they left these schools, they tried to live in mainstream America. Nobody accepted them. They would say, ah, you're a heathen. You're a dirty Indian. So they couldn't even get jobs off the reservation. And when they went back to the reservation, to their people, they ran into more problems. Many, many times they were not even accepted by their own people because their own people were saying, oh, you're too white. You act like a white man. So they're caught in between. So a lot of them turned to alcohol to try to hide all of it, to try to forget everything. They turned to alcohol and then later drugs. There were some who tried to make it. They, you know, they married each other because they knew each other went through the same thing. And they didn't want their children to go through what they went through. So they didn't teach them the language. They didn't teach them the culture. Those children, the children of these uh, first-generation boarding school uh, people, those children are today's elders. When they were born, they didn't learn the language. They didn't learn Lakota Star knowledge. They never got the opportunity to. When you look at an old person on the reservation today, they're not the connection to the ancient past. No, they were born in a Christian background. At a time when the reservations were strongly Christian. So this is what happened. That's a native experience that a lot of people don't realize. That this, is, this is what happened all over America and Canada too. So the next generation, they are sent to boarding school too. No choice. It's a little bit better, but they're still abused. They're still getting treated really no good. And so they grow up, have children, and they don't teach their children anything. What, what can they teach them? They don't know anything concerning their own language. This is why today most people cannot speak their own language and what little cultural information they know is Christianized, meaning it's dualistic and it's not the original ancient form. Okay, so the first generation of Indian kids that were sent to boarding school, since all around them were unhealthy adults, who did nothing but abuse them. They didn't receive healthy parenting. They missed things that they should have learned about life. So they're lacking emotional development. So when they grow up, and those who make it through these boarding schools and then they they have children, those children are also lacking that emotional support, that emotional development. Because the parents don't know how to do it. Yeah, All they knew and all they learned was abuse. All they experienced in these schools was abuse. They have a hard time trying to be a healthy parent. So they do the best that they can. But the children still are not receiving the proper emotional development, the, the experiences that that healthy children should receive from healthy parents. They're still missing that. And so when that second generation grows up, they know even less concerning healthy parenting. And so their children receive even less. And every time this happens, the next generation becomes more dualistic than the previous one. So let me try to say that again. The first generation boarding school kids, they didn't receive proper parenting skills. 
So when they have children, their children are not receiving healthy training that they should be receiving. They're receiving even less than their parents. Now that second generation, when they grow up, see, they know even less. So when they have children, those children are are receiving even less and it gets worse with each generation, which also means that the less healthy emotional development they receive, the more dualistic they become. So with each generation is more becoming emotionally underdeveloped, they are also becoming more dualistic. So today, it's a huge mess on the reservation. We're incredibly, as a whole, we're incredibly underdeveloped emotionally, and we are incredibly dualistic. We're quick to attack each other. We're quick to pull each other down. We're just like the rest of the civilized, dualistic world. Notice I didn't say white man, because this is all over the world. It's not just among white countries. It's all over the world. Wherever there is a dualistic ideology, where one gender is considered less than and property of the other gender, you're going to have incredibly underdeveloped emotional people which equals incredibly dualistic people and that is unhealthy so that started by the time of the late 1800s on the reservation and we are still feeling the effects of that and that's how we changed yeah we changed uh our our perspective to a Christianized perspective and a dualistic perspective. So now most Indians today, um, they categorize things as good and evil, just like everybody else in the dualistic world does. So this is why most Indians, when they hear a white owl story, they regard it as... Um, bad luck yeah when really it's not it's 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 to get you to change your life for the healthier yeah that's originally the belief so now you know so a lot of these stories um today's uh Lakota people see these stories as kind of bad. So that uh, shows you life is just what you make of it. No matter what circumstances you're faced with, it's up to you how you're going to deal with that. So it's really important to have a healthy foundation so you know how to get through these kind of experiences and that's why this show exists to help you with that to influence you with that I should say 